Good evening and thank you very, very much for inviting me. And uh, it is a great honor that uh, this book has been translated into Slovenian. And I want to thank, uh, to, to thank Marin, with whom this book was written, and Anna Zeligowski, who did the pictures. And I want to thank very, very much the three great women who organized all this uh, event, uh, Barbara Vilhar and Minka, uh, uh, Minka Vichar and Simona Stergultz. Thank you very much. And Dokapi, of course. Thank you. <laughs> so here is this picture. And this picture is uh, showing us something that uh, Anna Zeligowski called the five mothers. And this is a picture that is trying to tell us, so, to tell us something about what we are. And when we are asking ourselves, here we are, here I am, a human being with certain features, with certain characteristics, how did I come to be what I am? What is it that makes me what I am? And when, when we are asking this question, there are all kinds of answers that we are giving to this. And one thing is, there is this DNA. The DNA, our genes, make us what we are. And here is the first mother. And this is the root, the transmission of DNA. The DNA is making us what we are. But it's not just the DNA, it's also what is in the fertilized egg. What is in the fertilized egg, in addition to DNA, is also making us what we are, because there can be differences in, uh, in, in the cytoplasm which make a difference to what we become. Then there are, if we're thinking about ourselves, human beings, mammals, we have, there is the womb, and the environment of the womb is also important in making us what we are. And then there is early development. Very, very important, very important things happen to the baby during early development, which makes it what it is. Things that are transmitted to it through milk, through early maternal care. And then there is this whole huge thing, the great mother for us the symbolic mother, the mother culture. And this is making us also what we are. So this are, when we're thinking about what it is, how we become what we are, there are many things that we have to take into consideration. Many things which are important for our development. Now the very interesting thing is that these things are not just important for our development, they are also important for our evolution. And the reason that they are important for the, our evolution is that information transmitted through all these different routes and variations in information transmitted through all these routes can be inherited from one generation to the next. And if variations at different, of different types, genetic here, epigenetic here, behavioral, symbolic, can all be transmitted from one generation to the next and variations can be transmitted, then this can have evolutionary significance. And when we're thinking about a very complex creature like ourselves, humans, we must take all this into consideration. When we're thinking about plants, of course we don't think about culture, but we have to think a lot, not only about genetics, but also about epigenetics. When we're thinking about plants, for example, and when we're thinking about rats, we will not think about the symbolic system, but we have to think about all the other aspects. So, there are inputs, to put it, we, we can think about these five mothers, of course, no disrespect to fathers, just they're not in the picture, because it's too much. <laughs> so, so, we think about the provider of DNA, the provider of the non-DNA part of the egg, the provider of early nourishment, in the case of uh, mammals, womb and milk, the provider of home and care for social creatures, where parental <coughs> care is very important, and the providers of social education, if we're thinking about ourselves. And again, it's the same kind of things, just said a little bit differently. We think about transmission through DNA, through epigenetic cellular inheritance systems, through reconstructions of development. And this is transmitted not through the gametes, but some in a way that circumvents the gamut, soma to soma we call it, through socially learned behavior, also soma to soma, and through symbolic culture. Now, let, 
I will not talk very much about genetics because I'm sure that you all know a lot about it. I just want to say something, a few words about it. And that is that the very naive notion that we can think about genes for this, genes for obesity, genes for stupidity, genes for wisdom, genes for this, genes for that, this kind of naive picture is no longer valid. There are, of course, genes which have a big effect on the traits, that a difference in a gene, a particular gene, can make a big difference in a trait. But in the majority of cases, it is the gene network that is important. If we want to, to understand a trait, the development of a trait, how, the, how this trait comes to be, we have to think about a whole network of genes, these are the little black pegs, and the way they are interacting together and also interacting with the environment to form this developmental, developmental landscape, this epigenetic landscape, as Waddington called it. How development occurs. It occurs through the cooperation and interactions, very complex interaction between all these genes. So when we're thinking about genetics, when we're thinking about how genes influence what we are, we're not thinking about simple genes, we're not robots that are pulled by little strings. We, it is all this, all this collection of genes and they are in, they are the, these webs that are important and these webs interact with the environment. I want to say just an, uh, an, another thing. And I will not talk very much about it, I just want to point to it we can discuss it later. The usual way of thinking about mutations in genes were that these mutations are completely random. Now, there is an element of truth in this, uh, but we know that when, how many mutations will occur. We know that under stress, there is a burst of mutations of all kinds. We know that where a mutation will occur, when it will occur, this cannot can be this, this, this can be very the environment can have a very big effect on these things. So when we're thinking about genetic variation, we again have a very much more sophisticated view than the simple view that we used to have. However, we know quite a lot about genetics, so and we know a little and most people know less about epigenetics, so I would like to talk a little bit more about the epigenetic route of transmission of information and what epigenetics is. What we see here are different cell types in, a, in the body of this, uh, of this chimpanzee, a relative. And we know that the different cells in our body, on the whole, with some exceptions, have the same amount of DNA, the same DNA, and yet they are very different. And the differences between these cells have happened at some point during development. And then once they happened, they are fixed. So pancre pancreas cell, when they, when they uh, divide, they, bring, they breed true. There are more pancreas cells. Skin cells, when they divide, they produce more skin cells. So there is some kind of memory of the functional and structural uh, state of the cells. And we want to understand what this memory is. After all, all the cells have the same DNA. How, how did they come to be different and how? And this is very important for us when we're thinking about memory, about inheritance. How is, are these differences maintained? So. We understand, th these questions were asked some many years ago, but there were no good answers for that. And they became a focus of a lot of study when the mechanisms that underlie this kind of cell memory became clear to us. And what we shall see is that it is not just the memory within the body, but that this kind of differences, this kind of variations can be transmitted also between generations. So, when we're thinking about cell memory and about the systems that underlie cell memory and the inheritance of particular states, phenotypic states, morphological and physiological states of cells, we, we can think about several types of uh, me uh, mechanisms. And when we're thinking about epigenetics in general, we think also about 
uh, other ways of transmitting of information which are not cell to cell but are also transmitted through developmental reconstruction, behavior, and a culture. Now, the four mechanisms, cellular mechanisms of cell heredity are self-sustaining look, structural inheritance, chromatin marking, and RNA-mediated inheritance, and I will say a few words about each. Here are self-sustaining groups. What we see here are two cells. Let's think that they are bacterial cells, right? The blue, the, the, uh, the blue part, the dark blue part, is the regulatory region of, the, of a gene, and the light part is the structural region which produces the protein. And here we are, and this gene is not active, it is silent, and this silent state is inherited from one generation to the next. There is no product, the gene has no product, and therefore the daughter cell also has no product, and, and so on and so forth. Here we have the same cell, and what happened here is that the stimulus led to the activation of this gene. And as a result of this, a kind of protein product was formed. This protein product has two functions. One function is to have some effect on the morphology of the cell, and the other function is to bind to the regulatory region here and make the gene active so it produces more of this product. So this is a positive feedback loop. Now what happens? When this cell divides, the products, the proteins, are also distributed to the daughter cells. As a result of this, these products, are, are, uh, we see them in the daughter cells and they bind to the regulatory region. As a result of that, there is more of the product and so on. So we can come to this time, uh, to this point in time, and we see two types of cells. Cells which are inactive and cells which are active in the same environment, they have exactly the same genome and they breed true. How come? Because something happened in the history of these cells which made this, which in this case created this, feed, uh, this positive feedback loop and created differences which, not, which persist through the generations. Now this kind of thing is not rare. There are many examples for this kind of uh, feedback loops in microorganisms. And without going into detail, here is just one example from a nasty little pathogen, Candida albicans, a single cell fungi. And we know the different states of this fungus, morphological and physiological state of this fungus, are can be maintained for a very long time through two alternative feedback loops. So, there is quite a lot of this kind of thing in microorganisms. And we have here, and this is one type of epigenetic inheritance system, one type of epigenetic inheritance mechanism. Now, you've probably all heard about prions. Prions are those very unpleasant, uh, sometimes, uh, proteins which are self-templating, and they lead to, uh, to diseases such as the med cow disease. Now, what do we mean by self-templating and how is it related to cell heredity? Here we have two cells. This is the normal protein. That normal protein creates this, uh, this type of uh, white, uh, white protein product. And as a result, the, the cells have a particular phenotype, a particular morphology, with, let's call it A. Now, the same protein, under, because of all kinds of reasons, can form an alternative three-dimensional structure. We don't change anything in the amino acid sequence. We change, it's exactly the same, but the way that it is organized, the three-dimensional organization is different. Now, once this happens in this particular way, a prion is formed, and this prion interacts with the normal conformation. When it interacts with the normal conformation, it makes it assume its own structure. So here we have an interaction, and as a result of this, of this the white one becomes, becomes a brown one, a, a gray one, and so on. So what happens is that, and this is of course inherited through normal cell division, and what we have in the end here are two cells, are, are, ce are cells which have, a prior, which have prion type of proteins, and these proteins tend to, make, uh, to create fibers, and as a result of that, they have a different phenotype. And again, we can look at, the at, at these cells, let's say these are yeast cells, at, in a particular environment, and we will see that there are two types of cells. 
one with phenotype A, one with phenotype B, they have exactly the same DNA, they are living in exactly the same environment, and yet they are different and they breed true. And this is due to this type of mechanism and to the simple symmetrical division of the cells. And again, we have many examples of these things in fungi. And here is one example in yeast. And what is nice about this example is that the experiment that were, were done by Susan Lindquist and her group was that they tried to see whether the, the, the different types of cells, which are only different in the sense that one has the prion and one doesn't have the prion, whether they will respond to selection. And they do. In one environment, the, uh, pr pri th those that don't have the prions have an advantage, and in another environment, those that do have the prion have an advantage. So, it's inherited and it's selectable. And again, there are many examples. Now, we come to something which is very important for us, and this is a specific example. I'm talking here about the inheritance of pathogens of methylation, which is, in fact, a particular case of the inheritance of chromatin states. Of the chromatin is the complex of DNA and all the other things that are attached to it, which, which are all kinds of uh, the histones and, how and the way that the particular histones, how they are modified, all kinds of non-histone proteins, RNAs, all kinds of things. Now, the state, so a gene, a particular region in the DNA, can have different chromatin structures in different types of cells. And one of the things that contributes to chromatin structure is the state of methylation of a gene. Now, what is DNA methylation? I'm talking now about a simple example of DNA methylation, which we find in mammals. And here we have CG sites. And the CG sites can be, the, the cytosine in the CG site can be either in a methylated states or in unmethylated states. And here we have three, uh, three, sites, three unmethylated site, sites. The cell now, the DNA is replicated. The new strands are one with a dashed line. And the, this, type of, uh, uh, the, this type of unmethylated uh, uh, cyt cytosine pattern is inherited in a very simple way, simply because DNA, uh, DNA is inherited. Here we have DNA methylation. These two sites are methylated on their C, and this one isn't. Now what happens when the, when the cell replicates? When the cell replicates, the old strand has the methylated cytosines, the new strand does, uh, does not. Now, Note that the CG has uh, the, comple uh, the, co the complementary sites are GC. It's a mirror image, right? And there is an enzyme, so they are, they are half methylated here and they are non methylated here. And there is an enzyme called methyltransferase 1 which recognizes asymmetry. And when it sees this kind of asymmetry here and here, here there is no asymmetry, it sticks a methyl on the new strand. And in this way, there is a reconstitution of methylation patterns. So once we have a particular methylation pattern, we can inherit it. And what we know is that these methylation patterns make a difference in terms of, they, they influence whether or not a gene will be transcribed. Uh, it's all very simple, simplistic what I'm saying, but basically this is the idea. So here what we have is the same, are two genes, the, the, this global gene and, this, and, this, and the gamma globin gene. This gene here is active at, and it is non-methylated in the promoter region, in the regulatory region, and this gene is inactive and is methylated, and at a different uh, stage of development, this situation is reversed. So DNA methylation is both part of the regulation of, gene, uh, of the system of regulating gene activity, and it also part of the inheritance of particular regulatory states. Now, we can think, okay, that's very nice. So all this happens within the body. How is it related to inheritance? Well, here we have a very interesting plant called Linaria vulgaris. Linaria vulgaris is a famous plant in the history of botany because it has uh, led to uh, Linnaeus changing his mind about the nature of species. 250 years ago, when this, uh, when, uh, when, when this type of flower was, inherited, uh, was discovered. 
This is the wild type, and this is the peloric variant. And in 1999, Enrico Cohen uh, analyzed this variant, which is heritable. And he found out that this variant is not a result of mutation, but it is a result of epimutation. It is a result of a change in DNA methylation, not a change in DNA sequence. And this is inherited. Moreover, what, was, what they discovered was that sometimes you have uh, flowers which are in between these two morphs, and they have an intermediate level of DNA methylation. And here we have an example which is very important for us, because this example, by the way, is not in the book, because it appeared after the book was published. Otherwise, we would have made use of it. <laughs> uh, this is a very important experiment. And uh, what happened here was that a mother rat was injected with a fungicide, which we all use to spray our vines, called vinclozolin, during a particular period when she was pregnant, between day 8 and 15 of her pregnancy. Now, what we're going to do now is to look at her offspring, her male offspring, and what happened to her little embryo offspring was that they got very sick. They had all kinds of problems, including reproductive problems, but they still had enough sperm so that we can see what happens to their offspring. Now, what we're seeing here is we're looking at this, and all this three, three gen four generations, the mother is the F0 generation, the F1, the F2, the F3 generations, they all have these diseases, and we're talking about quite severe uh, phenotypic changes. And th th these are correlated with changes in DNA methylation. Now, this isn't, there is no selection here. There's no selection here because all the embryos survive. They are born, they, they, uh, they breed, and so on. So, and, and the trans, uh, transmissibility of these diseases is 90%. And this is not the end. I, uh, David Cruz, who is, doing, who is looking at one of the phenotypes of this, already talks about the sixth generation. It's, it's transmitted through six generations already. So this is another case of epigenetic inheritance where DNA methylation is obviously involved. Now, I will not talk very much about this, but we have discovered recently, we, I mean, the biological world has discovered recently a very wonderful and complicated system through which uh, uh, genes can be silent, silenced, and this silent state can be transmitted through the generations. This is an RNA-mediated system, and it is based on the formation of small dub of double-stranded RNA. When a double-stranded RNA is formed, it is chopped to bits. These bits then are found by a, an enzyme complex. And one strand of the, uh, of, of the little RNA then can do all kinds of things. It can either go back and, jo uh, and go back to the messenger RNA, uh, to me any messenger RNA that is complementary and bind to it. And when this happens, this leads to degradation, or it can go to a DNA, a complementary DNA, and as a result of this, this DNA will be methylated, or in paramecia, for example, some unicellular organism, it can also go to DNA, and the bit of DNA to which it binds will be excised. Now, this will be inherited by normal DNA replication. This will be inherited through the system of DNA methylation that I told you about. And this can be inherited because there is an enzyme in some organisms that is called RNA polymerase, and it's doing exactly what DNA polymerase is doing. It is copying, and it is copying the little RNAs. And in this way, we have a parallel system of, of replication in cells. And these things can be inherited. Now, you can say to me, well, that's all very nice and very interesting, but maybe you are talking about some very rare things that happen in the world. You know, biology is so huge. We have so many species. There's so much variability. You can always find something. Maybe it's not important. Oh, this is just an example, sorry, uh, for the inheritance of uh, RNA-mediated uh, defect. Okay, so... 
we're going back to this very common thing that I hear, well, okay, so you have this bizarre case here and this bizarre case there, and you bring it together, and you give us a nice rhetorical kind of lecture about all these things, but it really isn't very important, is it? Well, it is. So because I heard it so many times, I decided to do a review with a student of mine, Gal Raz, and we just looked at the literature to see what do we have? What do we actually have? Because a lot of these people, those people who talk about prions, not always talk to the people who talk about DNA methylation. Those people who talk about self-sustaining loops don't talk about p to the people that are, uh, that are working with RNA-mediated inheritance. So we looked at all these things and we found over 100 cases in the literature at the cellular level where we know, in most cases, we know the mechanism where we have epigenetic inheritance. Now, you can say that maybe a hundred, over 100 is not very much, but in many of these cases, and especially in plants, we know that a case can involve, now we know, and I'm talking about work that has been published just in the recent year, we know that we can talk about thousands of sites in the genome whose pattern of methylation can be inherited for eight to nine generations. And I'm saying eight to nine, not because this is all, but that's all they looked at. Afterwards, they had to publish the paper at some point. So there are many, many, many examples of epigenetic inheritance. And the more we look, and we know, the more we know where to look and how to look, the more we find. Now, this is not the only thing. This was the second mother that I talked about, the epigenetic mother. But there is a lot more to transmission of information than the transmission through cells, single cells, gametes in the case of uh, multicellular organisms. We can transmit all kinds of things, for example, symbionts. We can transmit co various products of development, all kinds of chemical uh, substances that can be transmitted through the placenta and through the milk. We can transmit, the, all kinds of things can be deposited in the eggs of oviparous animals and plants. The morphology of the mother can affect the morphology of her offspring. And the relationship between the organism and its niche can also be reconstructed between generations. And of course, we have transmission through symbolic communication. Now, I don't have enough time to go through all this. Big stories can be told about them, and some of the stories are in the book, not all of them, because this is a very lively area, and all the time there are new examples, very exciting new examples are coming up. But you can get an idea. So here we are, and I want just to show you one type of inheritance which is very interesting. Uh, we can have two types of rats, a kind of cowardly rats and brave little rats. And it's, and people found out that this very much depends on how they were treated by their mothers. So here we have a, a mother rat, and the mother rat, what she's doing, she's crouching over her offspring and she's licking them. And she can be a good licker, and she can be a not very good licker. So a not very good licker is okay. I mean, the kids, the, the little pups are, are, are not dirty, but they're not licked a lot. And there is a good licker who really cares a lot and gives a lot of warmth and love to her little ones. So here she is, crouching over them and licking them. Now, if she licks them a lot, they will be brave little rats, and they'll grow up and will be ex uh, they'll explore the environment, and they will be not be easily stressed. If she doesn't lick them a lot, they will be cowardly and neurotic. Now, the point is that neurotic, that mothers who don't lick a lot, who have neurotic offspring, the offspring females will also not lick their offspring. This is part of the syndrome. And the uh, good lickers will have brave little rats who are confident and they have uh, happy in the environment, and they, the daughters, will also lick their rats. So again, we can have two lineages of rats which are different in their behavior and in, their, in the way that they respond to stress, and they are the same genetically, they live in the same environment, and yet they are different. And they are different because something happened in the history. At some point, a rat became neurotic, for whatever reason. Now, what is interesting about this, now this kind of thing has been known for a long time, by the way. 
But the reason that it became very interesting for people is that now we understand a little bit about the molecular basis of this behavior. We understand what is going on in terms of the genes that are acting in the brain. And what is happening is that in the non-licked rats, this gene, the GR, the, the GR gene, the glucocorticoid receptor gene, is methylated. Whereas in well-licked rats, it is demethylated. It happens in the hypothalamus, in the brain, and it's a very persistent stage. One, it happens, and the critical period, the sensitive period for this rat is between one and six days. This is when it has to be licked, or not licked. <laughs> so when we know a little bit about it, and we understand that the epigenetic mechanism that can be responsible for cell inheritance can also be responsible for cell memory. Here, there is no cell inheritance, because here we, what we have is a reconstruction, developmental reconstruction of behavior. And we have all kinds of things which are similar. We know that food preferences in rats in mice, in hamsters, what, what the mother eats can influence the food preferences of her offspring. And we know a little bit also about, uh, about humans. There's work in humans that is also suggesting that what the mother eats can uh, affect the food preferences of her offspring. And we don't know here the molecular mechanism, but I bet you it will be one of these epigenetic mechanisms. It can't be anything else, unless we'll find another mechanism, which is very likely. And here we have a different kind of transmission of information, and this is the transmission of song dialects in uh, songbirds. And we know that uh, birds that belong to the same species, to the same, uh, can, can have different populations, and different populations can have different dialects. And these dialects are characteristic of this population, so to some extent, not with very high fidelity, they are transmitted from one generation to the next. So that's another route of transmission. Here we have uh, a picture in honor of a very famous and very intelligent monkey called Imo. Imo is potato in Japanese. And this, the story is very nice. It's a story about Japanese researchers who started to look at, uh, uh, who started looking at the Japanese macaque. And they, in order to observe them, they put potatoes near the little river that was running to the sea because they wanted them to stay there and to eat the potatoes. And one of these uh, uh, macaques, a female called Imo, started washing the potatoes in the water. And this behavior spread and became the norm in the population. Afterwards, uh, there were all kinds of uh, variations on the theme that developed in this uh, population. For example, they started to washing them in the sea because it's nicer when the potatoes are a little bit salty. And they also started biting them so the salt will sink in. And we can imagine, we don't know what the end will be, maybe Imo's restaurant. <laughs> Imo is dead, by the way, already, unfortunately, already 40 years, but the habit stays. And here we have Caledonian crows, which are creating, which are uh, using tools in order to extract uh, all kinds of uh, worms and uh, caterpillars that they can't get to. And this is a learned, uh, uh, there are aspects of this behavior that are learned. Not all of this behavior is learned. Some aspects of it are learned. And uh, when they don't have the right tool, if they are given, for example, wires, straight wires by the experimenter, and with this straight wire, they can't get into it, they bend them, they make them into hooks. Very clever. And here we have some very inheritance in humans and a little bit of variation on the theme. Yes, and so the little girl changes the song and we don't know what the fate of this variant will be, probably not very good, but some variants do survive. And this is our symbolic culture that we know so well. Uh, this is uh, the way we can think about things. And this is the world in which we move. This is our symbolic landscape. Something that is so fundamental to us, which, which, is, thing, which is part of everything, in fact, that we do and are. So 
you can say, okay, fine, what did you do? Why do we need this perspective on evolution and inheritance? What, why is it important for us? Okay, so there are all kinds of ways of transmitting information, fine, so what? So let's think, so we have to give an account of why, why, why it's of interest. So first of all, it's in, important for the study of heredity. If we're saying a hereditary condition in a population, we no longer have to, we, we can't just assume that it's uh, differences in genes that make the difference. It may be epi epigenetic differences that make the difference. And if we want to do something about it, we'd better know something about it. Otherwise, we shall be misled. So it's also important because you see, we have clonal, uh, uh, that we have clonal plants. A lot of invasive cl plants are either clonal or they, because they start from very, very few individuals, they are more or less the same genetically, identical genetically. So we may think, okay, there won't be evolution there because these are pure lines, they are genetically identical. But this is not the case. If epigenetic inheritance occurs, if the environment can induce epigenetic variation, then there can be selection in pure lines, and we'd better know this. This is uh, the agricultural ecological aspect, we, uh, as well as the hereditary aspect. And it makes a difference to the way that we think about evolution, and I hope I have some time to talk, do I? Not much. And th it makes a difference to the way we think about uh, medicine. How long do I have? 10 minutes, okay, that's good. Okay. So, what can we say? So I said, first, first, already with the example that I gave you, the example with the prions, we saw that there can be selection and evolution on the epigenetic axis. This, this yeast cells were identical genetically. They were different only in whether or not they had a prion. And the frequency of prion-containing and non-prion-containing cells changed as a result of selection. So this is one thing. There are many other aspects. I will concentrate only on those that are in light blue. So here we have Arabidopsis, and we, what we see are different methylation patterns among 96 Arabidopsis ecotypes. What we see, these are the ecotypes here. I mean, it's like this, right? And this, this here are the genes that we're looking at. And what, what we see is that when we're looking at a population of Arabidopsis plants, we see a lot of variation in different ecological conditions. Now, we don't know in this particular study whether these epigenetic variations are inherited, but we know from other studies that about 50% between, about 50% in more or less healthy plants, epigenetic variations are inherited for something like eight generations. So if this is the case, then we can have, because we have a lot of patterns of uh, uh, methylation within a given genome, there can be many combinations of different variations, and therefore we can have quite interesting and quite important evolutionary change only on the epigenetic axis. Now, we can also, we know that there are, that we can have cultural evolution, not only in, our, uh, in us humans, but also in chimpanzees, and this is just one example out of many. These are two, uh, two, uh, two chimpanzees belonging to different uh, populations, and they have different, they, they have different traditions. For example, this is a nutcracking population in West Africa. There are populations in other parts where they have the same nuts, but they don't have the behavior. And, they don't, it, and it's not because they don't have a mutation for the behavior. They just didn't invent the behavior for some reason, and therefore it is not transmitted from one generation to the next. And here we have a population which is doing termiting, that is inserting a stick into a termite nest, and they're taking it out full of lovely, tasty termites and eating them. And again, this is a kind of behavior which is culturally transmitted, transmitted through social learning, non-symbolic. And differences in behavior which are transmitted from one generation to the next can also lead to speciation. This, there, there is a very, a very interesting story about indigo birds who are uh, parasites of some uh, species of finches. Uh, and what happens there is that a particular uh, parasite parasitizes a particular bird. That means that the, bird, that the parasitic bird lays its eggs in, uh, in a nest of another bird 
another species of bird, and this, bir and this uh, host bird is looking after the little ones. It doesn't know that they are not uh, its own. And, uh, uh, and the, the basis of this kind of parasitism is very, is very interesting and can be manipulated. What happens here is that once uh, the indigo bird lays its egg in a host nest, the little ones, the little chicks, learn the song of the host species. And the females prefer the song of the host species in which they were raised, and therefore they will choose males which sing this song. So the, the males learn to sing the song of the host, and the females prefer this song. Now, if we can take an egg and switch it into a nest, into, in, into a host species which it never saw, suddenly we will have a, a, a parasitic bird which where the males prefer, uh, when the males sing a new song, and the females prefer this song. So, and they will not mate with, uh, 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 the females will not mate with males who sing an inappropriate song. So in one generation, we can have reproductive isolation. We can have a situation whereby, because of behavioral uh, criteria, a particular bird will only mate with those who sing in a particular way. And in this way, a new population can be formed, which is reproductively isolated from the original population. Now, one of the very interesting things that uh, has been found was that during, uh, that it is not only environmental changes, but also genomic stresses that can lead to very big, ch very important changes in, a, a, in both, in both DNA and in, the, uh, ep and in epigenetic uh, factors such as DNA methylation. So what we have here is a population of, of plants and there can be all kinds of stresses, for example, an ecological upheaval, a very strong bottleneck which is causing the population to start from very, very few or even one individual. Polyploidy, which is a duplication of chromosomes or hybridization, when two species hybridize, they form a hybrid, and, and this can be very often, uh, this can be accompanied if the number of chromosomes is unequal by duplication of chromosomes, allopolyploidy. Now, all these kind of things, this very, very strong stresses lead to an upheaval, to a kind of revolution in the plant genome. Transposable elements, all kinds of genetic elements, start jumping around. The pattern of methylation can be very, very drastically changed. 13% of the genome in wheat, after following hybridization, changes its methylation pattern, and these things can be inherited. So what we have here is a very, very big change, a, a great variability, genetic and epigenetic, which is brought about by great stress, and this can be then selected. So the epigenetic mechanisms are not only mechanisms that are important for microevolution, they can be also important during those periods where there is a very big macro variation, creation of macro variation. So we can think about microevolutionary changes and macroevolution. Now, medicine is very important for us, and we would like to see how all these things with, that we have learned are important for what we uh, how we can treat disease, how we, get, how we can get healthier. Now, what we know is that epigenetic inheritance, cellular epigenetic inheritance that I was talking about in the first part or third of the lecture, uh, is uh, important for understanding many types of cancer, some complex diseases and environmental diseases and age-related diseases. Now, here we are, what we have learned about the relationship between inherited patterns of methylation within the body and cancer. Now we can have tumor suppressor genes, genes that inhibit the formation of cancer, and it is important that these genes will be active, and they normally are active. But these genes can become, for whatever reason, methylated, and once they are methylated, this is transmitted there is no inhibition of cancer formation, and therefore the chances of cancer developing are much, much higher. And here we have the opposite. We have oncogenes, which are genes which cause, whose activity causes cancer. 
in the wrong place at the wrong time. And usually these genes are heavily methylated, so they are not expressed. But if they are demethylated for whatever reason, and that can be as a result of nutrition, of stress, of all kinds of things, of age, this situation is inherited and the chances of cancer are greatly enhanced. This is very important for several types of colon cancer, for example, but not only. Now, aging. We know that aging too, aging is a very, very complex phenomenon, but we know that one of the things that happen during aging is a change in DNA methylation of many, many genes. And we also know that food can, can lead to changes in, methyl in DNA methylation. We know that people who are living in very poor conditions have, there are all kinds of, the, 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 the offspring that they bring into the world are usually smaller and thinner and this, they have a, a predisposition for many diseases in uh, later ages. And we know from work on rats that where this kind of system has been simulated that there are changes in DNA methylation in very important genes which are related to the functions of the liver, to, fun to, to cardiac functions and so on. And here we have a nice example from uh, rats. Now these two rats which look, uh, this is mice, sorry. These two mice that look rather different uh, have the same DNA sequence, exactly. And the reason that they are different is uh, dependent on, on the food of their mother. This fat yellow mice, mouse is bigger, fatter, and uh, tends to have tumors and uh, diabetes and all kinds of problems. And this is a normal little looking mouse, you know, healthy, happy, so on. But they are genetically identical, exactly the same. And here we are, they are what she eats. Now this, I mean, it's a particular strain of mice that we're looking at. In this mouse, this mouse had a normal diet and her offspring, most of them were yellow and she, uh, and she had some uh, uh, brown mouse. And he, here is the same uh, mother from the same pure line with exactly the same DNA or even the same mother, but this time uh, uh, given folic acid and what happens now is that the number of no normal brown mice that she uh, brings into the world is proportionally higher. So, and we know in this case also what the gene is and we know that it is a difference in methylation that makes the difference in the activity of the gene. Now, okay. So, what are we to conclude? There are many, many other aspects that of course we can talk about but uh, I think that what happens is that because we are thinking about heredity in a wider way and we are thinking about mechanisms of heredity, of transmission that are at the same time also part of regulation, we have to expand our notions of heredity and evolution. They have to be not only defined like uh, as Dobzhansky suggested that uh, evolution is a change in, the, in gene frequency. This is not sufficient. It's okay. There's nothing wrong with this, but it's too narrow a definition. So we have to think about heredity and about evolution in a wider sense. And it has many, many broad implications, some of which I touched here, that are important from a theoretical point of view and from practical points of view. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much for this interesting lecture. Any questions at all? <laughs> I hope you have. <laughs> yeah? <laughs> okay. uh, I would like to uh, ask you about your opinion um, concerning this uh, hypothesis of the expansion of evolutionary and hereditary theory in biology. Um, it is interesting, uh, I noted that uh, this uh, extension brings us back to the some pre darwinian concepts of evolution, like the marketing view, uh, the, I don't know, 
about characteristics. And uh, my first question uh, is <coughs> whether you think that the inclusion of epigenetic levels and, uh, I don't know, genomic regulation, metabolic regulation opens uh, <coughs> some new space for um, the returning to another predominant concept of structuralism in biology. You know what I mean? Uh, about the laws governing organismic structures, their dynamics, and morphologies. Um, Okay, so you have two questions really about Lamarckism and about the structural uh, approach to biology, which is not exactly the same. Yes, okay, okay, okay. Yes, I think, I think the answer is yes. I think that in some ways we are, uh, Lamarckism was a very dirty word in biology for a long time, in evolutionary biology. And it was partly because Lysenko made such a terrible uh, abuse of genetics and, uh, and, and was a tyrant and charlatan. And, uh, but, but yes, there are aspects. I mean, you know, the inheritance of acquired characters in a way is an unfortunate phrase. It's the inheritance of developmental predispositions maybe that, that is happening. And it, this epigenetic mechanisms show how it is possible. We're, we're sure, we, we see in the case of this uh, mice that got the vinclo that the, the grand grandmother got the vinclozolin, their, their father, the, the, the first generation was uh, affected by this. It affected the embryo in utero. And then this, this thing that happened to their great-grandfathers was uh, transmitted through the generation. Not the trait, but the developmental predisposition for the trait, the methylation pattern on, the, on, on particular genes. So yes, I think that we are going back to this, but we are going back, you know, Lamarck talked about subtle fluids. He had a kind of 18th century idea of physiology. We have molecular biology, and one of the things that molecular biology has taught us is really that we have to expand our notion of gene regulation and of heredity. And yes, you're absolutely right. This brings us back to a, a, a legitimation of some Lamarckian ideas. Although we're not saying that it's all Lamarckism, Darwinism and selection are always important, uh, I don't think that we can have easily um, cumulative adaptive evolution without selection, but there are other aspects of evolution that we have to take on board, which for a long time we didn't. So that's one. Second thing about structuralist approaches to uh, biology, for example, Goethe is a very good example. All this uh, natural philosophy of the eight, of, uh, 19th century is an example of this approach to biology. This is a, a different take on epigenetics. There are people today that are looking at very at generic kind of laws of development. What is happening to what they call soft excitable matter uh, when certain things, which have certain very si relatively simple properties, whether these simple properties can give us order for free, so to speak because of interactions, because of the logic of the kybernetic mechanisms, of the regulatory mechanisms. And they are claiming that we, that we can get quite a lot of order for free. Not everything is free, but we can get quite a lot more than we thought. And to some extent, the kind, the new mole the, the molecular bio what molecular biology is revealing, they are basing their arguments on this. But this is a different take on epigenetics from the one that I have described here. I was just going to say, the evidence is uh, uh, the idea of a uh, playground, I have to say, for the uh, synthesis of those groups. Uh, the medical level, <coughs> organs can not be uh, approached in such a way that I'm not getting to it, but then laws uh, come into action. Y yes, I mean, when you're talking about epigenetics, you are talking about. Uh, things that uh, uh, you're, you're talking about exactly this developmental playground and we're starting with the molecular level. So you have to define the laws that apply to this playground. And there are many different laws and different people have a uh, focus on different things. I was focusing because Marian and I are geneticists. We, we have focused very much on the heredity aspect of, uh, of epigenetics. Other people focus on the, the developmental aspects more the developmental aspect, the generic properties of uh, biological systems, plasticity, and other things. So, but our, I think that our, we, we are a bit biased, being geneticists in the past. <laughs>
Yeah, you've shown us the lecture and you've shown us a couple of examples how actually you can get into the actual work. You've shown us a lot of different examples that you just always struggle to survive. And one of these is the relation between the predator and the prey. The? You know that some prey are That's right. So can these things can they have genetic and for example the communication of certain neighborhoods? Yeah. Uh, First of all, I want to make it clear. I don't think that we can get rid of genetic explanations for one minute. We can't. And differences in genes make a difference. So this is one thing that I want to make clear, but all I'm saying is it's not the whole story. Now about your question about invertebrates and, for example, uh, how, how they respond to poisons or all, to all kinds of uh, things. Uh, Darwin, when he was, uh, Darwin, when he was talking about the white cabbage butterfly, he was talking about host imprinting in butterflies. And he was, uh, and uh, he noted that where the eggs are laid and what the caterpillar eats will afterwards dispose it, dispose, the, uh, dispose it when it is a, a butterfly to lay its eggs on the, same, uh, on the same plant. So you can have this kind of, if you have this kind of feedback loop between the organism and its food source, you could have, uh, you, you could form and this will happen through some kind, I don't know what, what kind of developmental epigenetic mechanisms. This could form a kind of feedback loop which will lead to a particular food preferences in this line of butterflies. Now, I don't know if this will happen with predators and prey, but I don't see, but if, if you can imagine that there is some kind of, you have to imagine some kind of feedback loop like this. If you can imagine it, then it would happen. I mean, there was a, you know, there is this very famous story by Bush, uh, not, not the president. <laughs> uh, that where, <laughs> yeah, the other Bush. Uh, the, that uh, you, you had these flies in the United States that changed their preference uh, for um, um, uh, the food preference from, I don't, I don't remember what, uh, what the change was, but from one type of fruit to another type of fruit. And the question was, what exactly, it happened in very, very quickly. And of course, selection was involved there, but it seems that, again, what happened there was that once, for whatever reason, and it may be because uh, there were few of, this, uh, of, the fruit fly, uh, of, the, of the fruits of the preferred uh, uh, tree, I don't know what happened there, but once they switched to another one, to another type of tree, which maybe in the beginning wasn't very good for them, they, they, a kind of loop like this has been formed and therefore it went on happening. So that you, you got two lines of flies and of course there will be genetic differences which will enhance this preference. They will be selected too. So I don't think that it is on an ep epigenetic story. It may start from a kind of developmental response which is reinforced and that leads to a self-sustaining kind of population that is, uh, that is preferring one type of uh, tree. And then any genetic mutation that will go in the same direction and will stabilize this preference and will ameliorate any deleterious side effects will be of course selected. So you will always have genetic selection. I have problems with your case of bird songs and dialects. Yes. 
because I know experiments when they took uh, young birds from the nest and uh, deprived them of learning the songs from their father or mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. other uh, neighbors. Yeah. Other males in the group. And they uh, still began to sing, but very simple Song. phrases. Yes. Very simple songs. And uh, these simple songs were not different to other dialects. If you took other young birds from the other population mm -hmm. with another dialect. Mm -hmm. So, uh, I cannot put this into the name. Okay. For yes, all right. Okay, the, it depends very much on the type of species that you are looking at, but it, you are right. I mean, there is a basis which is common to the species, but there are variations on the theme. And the particular variation is what interests us. I mean, we, we humans, we all speak language. We all speak language. Our language has probably evolved, I don't know, let's say from one language at, at some ancient past. And we still will uh, develop, and, but, but, but they go the different paths. Now, what, what, I, what I understand that happens in, uh, with song dialects is that yes, in some birds you have a strong common base, but on this base you can form different variations. Now, how many variations you can form is a very important question for biologists, because this will define the range of cultural inheritance that is possible in this species. And in some species it will be very low, will, will be very small. In other species, it seems, where you can learn a lot also during adult life and within the same group, and there will be kind of synchronization and convergence, there is more. So how much cultural evolution you can have in songbirds is a very good question. Sometimes it is limited and sometimes it is quite extensive as far as I know. I'm not an expert on this. Okay, um, uh, I have one to, to finish this discussion. Anyway, you will have more uh, opportunities to ask the author's questions later uh, in the fall. But my question is, who is this? Ah. <laughs> okay, this is Ibrahim Istabra. This is a character that Marion and I invented and it's his part of the book. At, every, at the end of every chapter, we were trying to think about the most intelligent and uh, annoying questions that we heard about what we were talking about. So we all didn't always have the right questions and people say, why didn't you say, ask this and why didn't you ask that? But he's, he has, he's the devil's advocate. And Ibrahim Istabra is a, a Talmudic expression for the opposite conjecture. Because when you're studying the Talmud, what happens is that you are giving an argument, and then your friends over the, on the other side of the table are giving the opposite argument, and then you switch. <laughs> and you defend, yeah? So it's kind, of, it's kind of really playing the devil's advocate. And it's a very good method for studying. Because we always have to be very careful about what we think. And, uh, be our own devil's advocate. So that's him. Thank you, Eva, very much. Thank you.